Good morning. Um, I'm Aaron Miller. Um, I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk and for putting this workshop together. Um, today I'll be presenting our work on cooperative perception and localization for cooperative driving. Um, this work was done in the Search Based Planning Lab at Carnegie Mellon, um, along with my advisor, Max Likachev, um, at Kyungsoon Rim as well. Um, parts of this were published um, in our paper at ICRA 2020, and then there's some work included here as well, which we've done more recently. So I'll start with some motivation for our problem. Um, we start with the fact that um, over the next couple of years, we expect the road to be shared between three different classes of vehicles. Uh, the first would be level four, or what I will call L4, fully autonomous vehicles. Um, these are vehicles that require no driver monitoring. They're fully autonomous. Um, these kinds of vehicles are currently in development by a variety of companies, um, but they're not yet widely available to the public. Then the second class of vehicles would be level two or L2 vehicles. Um, these are vehicles with some sensing and driver assistance capability, um, things like lane keeping assist, adaptive cruise control, um, something like Tesla autopilot, um, where the vehicle can control the steering and acceleration, but the driver has to be um, paying attention at all times and ready to take over. Um, and then the third category of vehicles would be everyone else, uh, vehicles with, no min with minimal or no sensing, uh, capabilities. Um, and these are other vehicles on the road that we just have to um, be aware of and navigate around. Um, so the, the idea here is that it's useful for L2 vehicles um, to be able to operate autonomously for some amount of time by partnering with an L4 vehicle on the road um, and sharing data over a network um, like a V2V communication link. Um, so this looks like um, the scenario you see in the bottom here. Um, specifically, we're looking at highway driving, um, where we have one L2 vehicle paired with one L4 vehicle, uh, sharing data over a V2V link. Um, and then um, the two vehicles can share perception data, they can share localization data, um, though they will also do some cooperative planning as well. Um, but I'm going to focus specifically on the perception and localization components. So just a quick example of what this looks like in simulation. Um, we have an L4 vehicle here in red, L2 vehicle in black. Um, we see that they can do simultaneous lane changes um, in kind of a typical highway driving scenario. So then why do we need cooperative sensing um, in this task? You might think we can just uh, take the data from the L4 vehicle, it has high quality sensing, um, and just use that. Um, but really, neither vehicle has all the information required to do cooperative planning. Um, there may be vehicles that are out of range of the L4 sensors or not visible to the L4 sensors, for instance, because of occlusions. Um, but these vehicles can still be relevant for the cooperative planning problem. Um, for instance, if we look at these vehicles behind here, um, in particular this vehicle, um, if this vehicle is accelerating forward, um, then there might be a case where it's safe to do lane change for the L4 vehicle, um, but the L2 vehicle wouldn't want to move into this lane um, because there's a vehicle coming up from behind. Um, and we need to be aware of that kind of thing if we want to do cooperative planning. Um, and then the other component of this is that the sensors on the L2 vehicle um, might not give accurate enough measurements for perception or localization. Um, the L2 vehicle is going to have um, I'll go into this more in a minute, but it has kind of low quality radar and cameras and a um, fairly low accuracy GPS. Um, so we want to use higher quality data from the L4 sensors, um, at least in, re in regions that those sensors cover, um, to get better estimates of where the vehicles are around us. Um, and then the final thing to note here is that we're, um, we're doing this at highway speeds, so we can't neglect things like latency and communication, or um, the fact that other vehicles are moving dynamically um, on their own. So there are a couple categories of related work here. Um, first, we have some related work on fused perception for two vehicles. Um, these approaches often um, either use really heavy representations that don't fit into our bandwidth limitations, um, or they're designed to work kind of at low speeds, um, fairly static environments and they don't necessarily work in the um, high-speed dynamic environments with latency um, that we see in highway driving. 
And then there's also a variety of works on distributed sensor networks, distributed Kalman filters, and that kind of thing. Um, here we're focusing specifically on two vehicles, um, so we're not really concerned with um, how this would function in a more distributed sens uh, sensing setup um, with a larger number of vehicles. Um, and then our work takes a lot of inspiration from um, single vehicle multi-target tracking, um, the kind of systems that you would typically see on a self-driving car. Um, and these works kind of have many approaches that they use for solving the association problem um, across multiple measurements from the same sensor. Um, what we're going to be doing is trying to do association across um, sensors from two different vehicles. Um, so it's a similar kind of problem and we'll use similar approaches um, to the typical multi-target tracking approaches. Um, they'll use various cost functions. They have some uh, geometric cost functions or appearance-based cost functions. Um, and of course, for both of these, there are engineered approaches, there are learned approaches. Um, and then they'll also often solve this association problem with the Hungarian algorithm, um, which they'll typically use for matching individual frames to each other. Um, we're going to use it for matching um, measurements across two different vehicles. Um, so a little bit more information on the test vehicles that we use. Um, we do have some physical test vehicles that we're running on. Um, the L2 test vehicle has kind of cheap, low fidelity sensing, what you'd expect from a typical production um, level two vehicle. Um, it has basically cameras and radar for perception. And then for localization, it has a kind of low quality GPS. Um, and then the L4 vehicle has more typical L4 sensors. Um, it has everything that L2 has. And then it also has LiDAR coverage all the way around the vehicle. Um, and finally, the um, GPS on the L4 vehicle is a very high accuracy centimeter bubble, um, RTK. So I'm just gonna take a second to um, point out where our contribution um, fits into the larger system on each of these vehicles. Um, so we're assuming that both the L2 and the L4 um, will have their own kind of perception and tracking stack um, which runs on each vehicle. Um, so for instance, on the L2 vehicle, um, we assume that there's some perception module which takes in uh, data from the, from the uh, sensors on the L2 vehicle, um, maybe does some detections on that, and then we assume there's a tracker um, which will do associations across time um, from sensors on the L2 vehicle. Um, and we assume the L4 vehicle has the same thing. Um, this is kind of a standard pipeline that you would see on a self-driving car. Um, and then what our system does is um, we take the tracks from the output of each tracker on each vehicle and we fuse them together into a single um, estimate um, of the vehicles in the scene. So just a little bit more about the um, mathematical formulation that we use. Um, we assume that each vehicle has some state um, which includes its position, x, y, um, its orientation theta, um, its speed, v, and then also its angular velocity, uh, omega, or you could equivalently um, use the wheel angle here. Um, and then at each time step t, um, there's a new set of measurements available from both the L2 and the L4 perception and tracking systems, as well as the localization systems. Um, I should note here that these measurements are made at time t on each vehicle, but for instance, the measurement on the L2 vehicle at time t may not be available on the L4 vehicle um, until some later time um, because of network latency, um, and that message may not even arrive at all on the L4 vehicle. Um, so then we also have this um, probability of missed detections or false negatives, um, which we call PFN. Uh, we assume that essentially for each vehicle making a measurement and each vehicle that it could be observing, um, there's some probability that uh, that vehicle will not be observed um, in a given time frame. And then um, for vehicles that are observed and for the localization as well, um, we assume that all the measurements are Gaussian distributed uh, with known covariances here. Um, and we assume that the noise is independent um, 
between the two vehicles and between different vehicles that are being measured, um, but not necessarily between sequential outputs from the tracker. Um, and in practice, this tracker is kind of looking at a history of measurements. Um, and so often, um, outputs from the tracker will be highly correlated with previous outputs um, from the tracker. So a couple main challenges here, um, which we're looking to tackle. Um, the first would be the communication delays between the L2 and L4 vehicles. Um, next would be matching between what the L4 sees and what the L2 sees. Um, and here we have, of course, differing viewpoints and occlusions between the two vehicles, um, which make this more challenging. Um, we have to account for the possibility that the L2 vehicle sees a vehicle that the L4 doesn't see, or vice versa. Um, and then finally, of course, we have um, noisy measurements um, for every measurement that we're taking. So I'll start by going over um, our cooperative perception approach. Essentially, our cooperative perception algorithm is going to have two components. Um, the first is going to be the matching component, which um, does association between measurements made on the L2 vehicle and measurements made on the L4 vehicle. Um, and then the second component is going to be extrapolation to deal with latency. Um, and I'll talk about extrapolation a little bit later. Um, so for matching, um, like I said, this is non-trivial. Um, we're assuming Gaussian measurement models here. We have some probability um, EFN of false negatives or missed detections. Um, so an example matching problem might look something like this, where we have an L2 vehicle here, L4 vehicle here. Um, the measurements from the L2 are shown in yellow. So we have the L2 localization here. And then the L2 perception system has observed the L4 vehicle here, as well as this other tracked vehicle up here. Um, and similarly, from the L4 vehicle in blue, we have the localization here, and then three observations from the perception system on the L4 vehicle. Um, and we should note here, there's uh, one other vehicle in the scene that's observed by both perception systems. And then there's one vehicle up here, um, which was observed only by the L4 perception system. So essentially, the way that we're going to solve this, um, we're going to take this matching problem that we have on the left here. Um, we have uh, measurement models for each of these. Um, we have our false negative model. Um, and we're going to take all of these measurements um, write out the likelihood for all measurements from both the L2 and the L4 vehicles. Um, and then we're going to see that the log likelihood of all of those measurements can be written down in this bipartite graph form that you see on the right here. Um, I'm not going to go in detail um, on how this is constructed, uh, but essentially on the left here, we have each measurement from the L2 vehicle. Um, first, the localization measurement and then the two measurements from the perception system. On the right here, we have measurements from the L4 vehicle. Um, first, localization again, and then three measurements from the perception system. Um, and then each edge in this graph um, has a cost coming from the log likelihood of the two measurements um, on either side of that edge, um, assuming that those two measurements came from the same actual vehicle. Um, so um, for instance, this edge here um, will be the log likelihood of making this localization measurement. Um, and then the L4 vehicle um, making this perception measurement that it did. Um, if we assume that the vehicle the L4 is observing here is actually the L2 vehicle. Um, so we can write down all these log likelihoods um, based on our measurement models and false negative models. Um, and because this decomposes nicely into this um, bipartite matching form, um, we can solve this efficiently with the Hungarian algorithm. Um, and then the output that we get from the Hungarian algorithm, um, we get this matching that you see here um, in bold on the right. Um, so I have, I have the measurements labeled over here. Um, we can see that the localization from the L2 was matched with um, Z2 from the L4. So that corresponds to this edge being selected here 
Um, similarly, uh, the L4 localization was matched with C2 on the L2, that's this edge here. Um, we have these two measurements from the perception system, which were associated with each other. Um, so that would be this edge here. And then for this, this vehicle, um, it was only measured by the L4. Um, so that's what these extra red nodes um, represent at the bottom here. They represent um, possible false negative associations. Um, so this measurement on the L4 um, was not associated with anything on the L2. Um, so it gets matched to one of these red nodes down here. Um, and then these, these extra red nodes that weren't used just get associated with each other. With, uh, each other. So in order to do that um, Hungarian algorithm solution, um, we need the likelihood to decompose nicely um, so that we can look at the total likelihood as just total log likelihood as just a sum of those edge costs. Um, but there might be cases where um, we want, for instance, the false negative probability to depend on where other vehicles are in the scene. Um, and then this, uh, the problem doesn't decompose as nicely uh, but this can be more representative of, um, of an actual um, uh, good false negative model that represents kind of how our sensors work um, and how occlusions work and that kind of thing. Um, so we also developed this occlusion-based false negative model. Um, the basic idea here is that we model false negative probability based on the angle phi um, that the target occupies in the sensor's field of view. Um, so here we have, we're looking at the L2 vehicle sensors here. Um, we see that each other vehicle in the scene occupies um, some angle phi here. Um, and for unoccluded vehicles, this is um, pretty trivial. Um, for occluded vehicles, um, we use only the visible angle. Um, so that's going to be a smaller fraction um, because there's this other vehicle here blocking the view from the L2 sensors. Um, this gives us kind of a, um, a very simple um, model for false negative probability. Um, if we kind of make some, um, if we make some assumptions, um, assuming that we have um, some constant angular density of points or pixels that we're looking at, um, if we assume that um, missing the detection um, happens when we incorrectly classify all of those points occupied by a, sensor, by, um, a target vehicle in the sensor, um, which we could see happening if you're doing classification based on, um, for instance, point cloud segmentation um, or some other approach like that. Um, then we can assume we can assume each of those points is misclassified with some probability p, um, and then if we assume that those are independent, um, we kind of get this um, this very simple um, model for the log probability of a false negative. Um, we get that um, the log probability of a false negative is proportional to the angle um, with some co uh, positive constant alpha here, um, which kind of absorbs this constant p that I was talking about. Um, and in practice, that'll just be a hyperparameter that we tune. Um, so like I said before, um, this angle phi depends on the locations of the other vehicles. Um, so the problem doesn't decompose nicely. We can't uh, solve it with the Hungarian algorithm like we did before. Um, but in practice, it can still be solved for moderate numbers of vehicles um, if we do some gating on how far apart we can match tracks. Um, this is often done in multi-target tracking. Um, we just assume that two measurements that are some distance apart from each other should never be associated, no matter um, what the actual cost is um, globally for the other vehicles in the scene. So then the other component of the cooperative perception system um, deals with the extrapolation problem, uh, dealing with latency and communication. Um, we, have, we actually have a couple sources of latency here. Um, the main one is the communication between the two vehicles, um, but we also have the fact that we're, um, we're waiting for these measurements to make it through the entire perception stack on each vehicle. Um, so that may take longer than um, a typical single vehicle tracker would expect. 
Um, so then we're going to solve this latency problem um, by doing matching each time we receive a measurement from the other vehicle. Um, so on the L2 vehicle, for instance, each time we receive a measurement from the L4 vehicle, we're going to look up um, the corresponding measurement, um, which is going to be at some point in the past um, on the L2 vehicle. We're going to do matching there, and then we're going to extrapolate forward um, using more recent measurements from our own sensors. Um, just a couple minor notes here. Um, we're going to use the road curvature as a prior on angular velocity. Um, we often don't have good measurements of angular velocity, especially from the um, L2 vehicle sensors. Um, so road curvature kind of improves, um, it, it, acts, it acts as a really good prior here. Um, and then we also have to deal with measurement correlations. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but um, our measurements are coming out of a lower level tracker. Um, so they're highly correlated with each other, um, which just means that we don't take, um, we don't fuse every single measurement coming out of the lower level tracker. Um, we're gonna downsample um, until the measurements that we're actually fusing um, are not uh, noticeably correlated with each other. Um, so essentially we do this in an EKF. Um, we see the structure of that here, where um, on the top we have the most, uh, most recent measurement that we've just received from the other vehicle. Um, then on the bottom here, we have a measurement from our own uh, tracking system. So we start by fusing these together into some combined state. Um, this is just using like a, a standard EKF update. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned, we have lots of, lots of more recent measurements um, from our own tracker, um, but we're not going to fuse all of them. Um, so we, um, we take a state, we predict it forward in time, um, we fuse another measurement, and we repeat um, until we get up to the current time. So that was our cooperative perception system. Um, then for cooperative localization, um, we have kind of a, a similar system to what we saw in the EKF there. Um, we have to do cooperative localization um, because the L2 vehicle only has a low quality GPS, um, might be off by, um, on the order of meters or tens of centimeters, um, which is really too much for um, autonomous driving. Um, so we're gonna use a couple different sources of information. Um, the first is that low quality GPS from the L2 vehicle, um, but then we're also going to use um, the L4 vehicles, high quality localization coming from RTK. Um, this is typically like centimeter level accuracy. Um, and then we're going to use the relative position of the L2 um, as measured by the L4 perception system. Um, so then the algorithm that we're going to use here, um, we're going to take the L4 RTK, um, we extrapolate it forward um, to the current time. Um, we do the same thing with the um, with the relative position of the L2 um, as measured by the L4 vehicle. Um, and then we're going to fuse these together. Um, again, we're assuming Gaussian measurements here. So this is just a um, standard maximum likelihood fusion of two Gaussian measurements. Um, sorry, this is, um, sorry, these two, these are two um, essentially Gaussian vectors. Um, so we're going to add them together, um, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and then, um, yes, so this gives us the position of the L2 vehicle in the global frame. Um, we're taking the position of the L4 vehicle and then the relative position of the L2 in the L4 frame. So this is a, the position in the global frame. And then here we have the measurement from the L2 vehicle GPS, um, that low quality GPS. Um, so we take that and we fuse it um, with this um, estimated position from the L4 vehicle sensors. Um, and these two we fuse um, with a kind of Gaussian maximum likelihood uh, measurement model. Um, and that gives us the final estimate of the L2 state in the global frame, um, which we can use as our localization estimate. So we do a couple uh, different sets of experiments on this. Um, the first we do um, in simulation with kind of artificially injected noise 
Um, we add Gaussian noise on all state measurements. We add um, false negatives and we add latency and communication um, between the L2 and the L4 vehicle. Um, here we see that um, for the perception system, um, the RMS error um, is significantly better for the fuse system. Um, so here we have the cross track error, which is the error kind of perpendicular to the direction of travel. Um, and that is significantly better than the L2 system alone um, for kind of all latencies that we test at. This, uh, this bottom axis here is the amount of latency in the system. Um, then for the on-track error, which is the error um, along the direction of travel, um, for kind of typical latencies, um, it matches the cross-track error. As we increase the latency a bit, um, the on-track error does go up as well. Um, this is because we, we have a really good prior for the cross-track um, movement. Um, the road curvature is a really good prior there. Um, but we don't really have a good prior for um, how the vehicle will accelerate or decelerate. Um, so there's room for future work here um, and possibly um, modeling that better and modeling the uncertainty better. Um, we also test um, how the RMS error varies with the amount of sensor noise that we add. Uh, essentially here we see um, we have a very low um, fraction of kind of wrong associations in our system, um, which means that as, as we increase the error, uh, because these are, these are all like Gaussian noise uh, models, everything is very linear in the amount of error. Um, and then finally for localization and simulation, um, we see the raw measurement uh, location error here in red. Um, and then we have the fused local localization error here in uh, purple. And we see that that's significantly improved. Um, we do some experiments as, on real vehicles as well. Um, here you can see a trajectory we have. Um, this was running on the Bosch test track. Um, we have the um, ground truth trajectory um, in orange here. And you can see here, um, essentially we have portions of the trajectory which were only measured by the L2 or only measured by the L4 perception system um, and the fused output um, here in blue and it smoothly interpolates between those two. Um, also for localization, um, you can see here um, again in red is the raw measurement error and then in uh, purple is the output of the fused um, system. And you can see that we significantly improve here over the raw um, L2 localization. And then finally, we do um, some experiments in simulation, but with um, a more uh, realistic perception pipeline. Um, so here we do simulation in Carla with highway traffic. Um, and then we simulate actual sensor data, run an actual perception stack, actual tracking stack um, on each vehicle, and then use the output from those um, for the fusion system. Um, so here we, um, we use metrics um, inspired from multi-target tracking. Um, essentially the um, MOT-P here is the um, average position error, um, which we can see um, the fusion system essentially does at least as well as either vehicle alone. Um, but then the MOT-A, um, which is essentially the fraction of the vehicles that we observe correctly, um, is basically doubled um, from the individual vehicles to the um, fused system. Um, and you might expect these, you might expect these to be higher. Um, they're fairly low because um, we have a large number of vehicles in the simulation um, which aren't necessarily even visible um, to the sensors on either vehicle. Um, so essentially what we're looking at here is that um, for the fuse system, we're, we're comparing the fuse system output, um, which would be these two numbers here, to um, the output of either perception system alone. Um, and we see a significant improvement. So just to wrap up, um, we've shown that our system successfully fuses perception and localization data uh, while compensating for latency. Um, we've demonstrated that um, we can kind of extend the observable area from either vehicle on its own 
Um, and there are a couple areas for improvement. Um, we've essentially used um, a very classical method of doing this um, association and filtering. Um, there's a lot of room to incorporate learning-based approaches here. Um, for instance, we could um, try to learn the false negative model. Uh, we could try to learn some appearance-based features as well that we can include in the matching problem. Um, and there are lots of approaches for doing this on single vehicle multi-target tracking. Um, so there's a lot of potential to kind of incorporate those learning techniques from single vehicle multi-target tracking um, into this um, cooperative perception and localization system uh, that we're working on. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and uh, thanks again to the organizers for um, putting this all together. <laughs>